Good morning, everyone. I'm Rick Simons, uh, Managing Director here at the World Economic Forum. Hope you're having a very good week. This is a, one of the more important sessions uh, from our perspective here in the forum that's going to take place here this week because it deals with one of the critical unsolved challenges in the modern economy. And that is, as the title of the session indicates, building trust in data flows. Most consumers, and I would argue probably many business people, don't really understand how in the modern economy data ricochets across borders to run basic basic everyday applications of life, as well as value chains, up and down, supply, distribution, and whatnot. It's very difficult to run a modern a firm, even one that is domestically focused, let alone, let alone one that has quite a lot of international business, without cross-border data flows. And the world is beginning to fragment in this respect, and that poses yet another potential risk adding to already existing very visible risks to the smooth functioning of the world economy. Today's session is about that, and in particular, the, the catalyst for this session is an important act of leadership by the Japanese government. During the G20 process mm -hmm. in the past year, one of the priorities that the Japanese government set in those discussions was a concept of data free flow of trust. It was an early attempt to try to get a wider degree of convergence among countries on a framework or set of frameworks that would permit sufficiently free flow of data to allow that smooth functioning of the world economy and the smooth functioning of everyday business and everyday consumer life. I think it was an extremely important act of leadership, and they have taken a second step, and that's why it's so important here today to have this discussion. Following the G20 outcome, they reached out to the World Economic Forum in the belief that it would be beneficial in the next stage of the thinking about the Osaka track to have a wider stakeholder engagement, cross-industry engagement, experts, mm -hmm. many countries. So we are about to embark with the Japanese government, but with our various stakeholders and different industry communities into an intensive process during 2020 to think through what might be a few key ways to tackle this issue. How could we recommend best or good practice in a way that could indeed uh, encourage convergence in norms in this space. It's a very complex issue. We, we encourage you to engage in the process going forward. And with that, I hand it over to you, Commissioner. Thank you so much for uh, moderating today's discussion. Mm -hmm. Maybe the microphone. Can you hear me? Good morning. Hello. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really delighted to uh, be uh, invited here today to be with you in Davos to discuss how to build trust in data flows. As we heard from Richard, it's a very complex issue and it deserves a lot of debates uh, of all, all the possible partners and stakeholders. When I was in the role of the main negotiator of the EU-US privacy shield system and EU-Japanese uh, uh, adequacy decision, I was confronted with so many difficult questions from businesses, from public sector, from, from general public. Uh, how come that the, travel, that, uh, that the data can travel, pri our private data, our identity can travel somewhere outside? And how can we guarantee the full protection of the data somewhere else on another continent? And so believe me, it's a real pleasure for me to sit here today and ask these difficult questions, our distinguished <laughs> panelists. Uh, <laughs> Who are Mr. Hideki Makihara, State Minister at Japan's Ministry of Economics, Trade and Innovation. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Mr. Minister. Mm -hmm. Mr. Alfred Kelly, CEO of Visa. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, Madam Helena Lerang, Director General of Consumers International. Welcome. Uh, this is a good place and good timing for this debate because Exactly one year ago, uh, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced here his visionary idea of creating the global platform uh, where we will have the space for full trust and full protection of privacy, his idea of uh, data free flow with trust. Uh, this initiative was announced here and the European Union was uh, very supportive and still is supportive of 
these efforts uh, of Japan trying to invite uh, United States and, and other partners to create the, the, the truly uh, worldwide uh, space. And also, uh, I have to remind why these initiatives <clears throat> became so important also and visible uh, for, for everybody after the scandal of Cambridge Analytica. I'm sure you remember that. The need to protect private <clears throat> data of people better suddenly came out. And it's also in the United States, uh, I, I heard uh, something which sounded very nice to, to my ears. We would need something like European GDPR. <laughs> and of course, we don't want, uh, as Europeans, we don't want the world to copy-paste GDPR. It's, it's impossible, but uh, we would really like to see the high standards of protection of privacy uh, in the countries where especially uh, the, the trade and, and other kind of partnerships and cooperation uh, is, is up and running with this big intensity. <clears throat> and it, it comes to, to the, the, uh, the factor which we have to see now, uh, trade, data and security should now continue in silos. Uh, we should go out, uh, get out of these bubbles and speak about these things, uh, 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 taking the, the holistic approach and taking all the, all the factors in, in uh, consideration. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind our distinguished audience that you can ask questions using the Slido app. And if you are commenting on our discussion on social media, please use the hashtag WEF20. And before I give the floor to the panelists, uh, we do have a question to the audience for the Slido system. And the question is, are you confident that if your data moves abroad, it will be responsibly treated? Yes or no? Please use the Slido to answer it. They told me I don't have to wait for the result, but I'm so impatient to see. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about it? We will see the, the answers. And uh, I would like now to turn to our panelists. First uh, a question on how governments, businesses, and stakeholders can work together to build trust in data flows. Minister mm -hmm. Makihara. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Osaka track and why it is important in current context. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me uh, this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, as I pointed out, exactly one year ago, uh, our minister, uh, Prime Minister Abe delivered uh, the concept of EFFT. And uh, since then, uh, Japan has advanced the international uh, discussions with regard to the digital economy. And as the Osaka summit last year, we launched the Osaka track uh, together with 27 leaders uh, and the international organizations who supported the concept of DFFT. And under the Osaka track, Japan has facilitated the two uh, agenda items, uh, WTO e-commerce negotiations mm -hmm. and uh, policy discussions on the digital economy. And the, the WTO e-commerce negotiation is underway uh, towards achieving a substantial progress by MC12 in June. Mm -hmm. And the Japan leads the negotiation and the co-chair with uh, Australia and Singapore. Uh, Japan also shared our, our own text uh, proposal. Uh, this includes the three principles on data, namely, first, uh, data free flow, second, and the prohibition of data localization requirements, and the third, uh, prohibition of a disclosure requirements for a source code or algorithm, which were established in the past uh, economic uh, partnership agreements, including the TPP. And last year, the U.S. and Japan concluded the bilateral digital trade agreement that established the higher standard data flow rules uh, with a smaller policy space than uh, those in TPP. Mm -hmm. And in addition, it is important to uh, enhance uh, policy discussions on the greater breadth uh, subjects related to the digital economy than those at the WTO. And for example, we have to address uh, new challenges such as the uh, protection of uh, personal data, uh, governance uh, innovation, mm -hmm. and the social implement implementation of AI. And uh, regarding the uh, personal information uh, protection, 
uh, it is important to secure the interoperability in order to enhance uh, data flow while respecting the individual regimes in each nation. Uh, based on this idea, the Personal uh, Protection Commission of Japan launched the tripartite Tripartite, sorry, three uh, members uh, with uh, uh, counterparts in the United States and the European Union. And uh, through this meeting, Japan aims for the smooth flow uh, as well as the proper protection of uh, personal data within the, between the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the G20 ministerial meeting on trade and the digital uh, economy last June, the ministers agree on the need of work for uh, governance uh, innovation with a view to addressing the development of business uh, models and the society given the emergence of a new digital technologies such as AI as well as uh, bringing uh, agility and the flexibility to government regulations and the governance. And the D20 is currently collecting the best uh, practices in member uh, economies and the OECD will further examine the advanced cases. The OECD a global conference uh, on uh, governance innovation uh, was uh, hosted this month and where the uh, intensive discussions were held and uh, a report on new uh, approaches of uh, governance uh, models was uh, introduced by Japan. And the governance innovation is a global common agenda and I would encourage all of you to join the discussion. And on the domestic front, Japan will tackle regulatory reforms in response to digital technology, including the mobility field. And we also revised the information processing promotion law last year in order to promote a digital transformation in the government sector as well as the private sector. And given the legislation, we aim to establish a management system that responds to real-time changes and uh, to build a system that handles data in real time so as to realize a more efficient society based on trust. And uh, we will continue to develop the deceleration of a system in a timely manner. And uh, uh, finally, uh, actually, uh, last yesterday, uh, there was a closed session on uh, DFFT, and I took part in. And uh, I believe there are, uh, there are three keywords. And the first uh, is... Um, collaboration among the all stakeholders and uh, uh, second is a harmon harmonization of uh, all you know rule makings and the third is a speed and uh, uh, fragmentation mm -hmm. uh, should be avoided yes and uh, so for that purpose, Osaka track is very important. And uh, uh, in my personal opinion, I think the platform uh, where all stakeholders uh, can participate and can raise their voices uh, is necessary, like a COP for tackling with the climate change. Yeah. So that's my personal opinion. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Minister. Mm -hmm. uh, I will now uh, a little bit get out of my neutral role of, of the moderator and, uh, to, to say that on behalf of the EU, uh, we are ready to cooperate very closely on this mm -hmm. because uh, in all those platforms uh, and fora you mentioned, we will have to convince the others that it pays off. Uh, to protect the data of people right. and that uh, the stronger protection of private data is not uh, hindering innovations. Mm -hmm. So this is the task ahead of us. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. And now let's, let's go to business here. Mr. Kelly, why is the topic of cross-border data flow so important for business today? And how does a company like Visa address the privacy concerns of the customers and at the same time government security needs? Well, thank you, Vera. It's good to be here. And I'm encouraged. I don't, I don't know whether it was two people or six or more that answered the survey, but at least I like the trend of the 75 percent. And I applaud uh, the Japanese prime minister and Japan for the, the, their leadership. I think this whole idea of data flows with trust is a great foundational way to begin to think about this issue. I'd like to provide a little bit of context why this is important. Global, open, interoperable networks power the world. The reality is that today you can fly from Lisbon to Buenos Aires, and networks make that happen in a frictionless, safe fashion. Uh, you can get on your cell phone here in Davos and call somebody in Tokyo. 
uh, you can travel the world and get cash out of an ATM machine, no matter where you came from and no matter where you end up. You can use a card, a uh, credit card issued in the UK in Sydney this afternoon and know that it was used in a frictionless way and a safe way and your data will be, be protected. And those open, interoperable, global networks that power the world are fueled by data. With, without data, those networks couldn't, in fact, power the world. And those networks not only open the world, but they shrink the world. And they make the world more accessible for more people. And so for us at Visa, who operate one of these global, open, interoperable networks, we need data to be able to make sure that it, that it flows across country to make, countries to make sure that it is, in fact, totally secure. In fact, every day we interrogate 100 percent of the transactions that we see. And last year, because of having data that flowed across borders and our ability to interrogate that data, we prevented $25 billion dollars of fraud that would have otherwise happened mm -hmm. without having that network and without having that data. That is just one simple example of the power of the networks and how very, very good it is in terms of protecting consumers around the world. Hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Uh, and now I will go to the world of consumers. Uh, Mrs. Laurent, um, how do you see the priorities for consumers when their data moves abroad? Thank you. Um, so first, thank you very much for involving consumers in this discussion. Um, quite frequently, we find that the consumer voice is not involved in a way that you might expect. Um, and you find yourself sort of lurking in the corridors of the WTO trying to talk about consumer issues. Um, so it's fantastic to be able to potentially put consumers at the heart of the, the deal, if you like, at the heart of the, the conversation. Um, I was particularly uh, pleased that uh, Roberto Azevedo asked us to think about, well, what would an e-commerce deal look like from a consumer perspective as well? Um, here's why uh, consumer, the consumer perspective is, is so important. Um, I think it's because people would have a different opinion to the one that was shown here in the room about confidence in the data flows. Um, First, a little bit about uh, us. We look at food, finance, energy, mobility across the world. We're present in 100 countries with 200 organizations uh, that represent the consumer. And you're thinking about each part of the consumer journey. So from the information you get at the start, the process uh, through purchase, and then the opportunity for redress, uh, the UN consumer guidelines, which were updated most recently in 2015, include uh, the, the right to uh, information about sustainable consumption, uh, that the protections offline should be as much as they are uh, in the, the real world. Um, now, this is very much a global issue. I was just in touch with my, uh, our member in Zimbabwe, and she said one of the top issues is the sort of access and cost of, of transmitting money abroad. And um, so this is very much a, a global piece, even though consumers are at different stages of that journey wo worldwide. So the key thing, uh, the thing that struck me, especially sort of I have a background in business, coming into this as you talk to consumers, a word that really stuck with me, and it was in relation to IoT and connected devices, is consumers find this all a little bit creepy. Now, it's not all, I will come to the good part next. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to build on creepy, right? Um, and, and why is it creepy? Well, it's because there's a world that's hidden here, and it's hidden in terms of the data that goes abroad. You don't know that it has gone abroad. You don't know where it's going. Um, the business model seems to depend on that lack of transparency sometimes. And there are so many sort of uh, points where this becomes horribly apparent. So... Um, there's, of course, the connected toy, you know, high-profile cases where 
a toy uh, will actually be giving data on to organizations that do share data in a way you absolutely wouldn't want. Um, most recently, our Norwegian Consumer Council looked at 10 apps which are sharing data in a way that, you know, about sexual preference, about localization, to then 130 different organizations behind which were monetizing that data. Now, you can absolutely say these are sort of specific points, but they don't make that feeling of creepy go away. And um, this is combined then with a sense of, but when I go online, how can I be sure about product safety? So the OECD did a fantastic survey of banned products, and they found that, and there were a significant number of banned products they reviewed. 68 of them, 68% of them, excuse me, were still present online. And when you try and buy online, you're pretty much sure that your data is going to disappear somewhere. You're not very confident about that you know, the, the security in the first place, you know you probably don't know how to change the security. And then redress is so difficult, especially when that product is from somewhere else. Uh, it could be because it's bought from another country. It could be because the platform doesn't necessarily take the responsibility for looking after you. Now, um, the end piece is that this then can feel like there's a manipulation going on that there's discrimination going on from a pricing perspective, that my information is going to be used against me, potentially in ways that you know, are very much also from an economic perspective as well as from a human rights perspective. So, for example, am I going to get poorer pricing or even be denied health insurance yeah. because of data I'm giving you? And I just don't know. Now, I, I want to put that to one side because the other piece of all of this is, of course, in other research that we've done, consumers are obviously excited about this. This gives huge opportunity. I've been particularly, you know, there was creepy on one side. On the other side, you know, the desire of consumers to be involved in the innovation story. The opportunities to do things like connect consumers to farmers directly, which I think can completely change the way we think about our food systems, the way in which we reach the SDGs. I mean, th this is just a wonderful new world, and maybe there's a bit of a golden hour. You know, I, I don't know if anybody does photography, but there's that perfect moment at the, it's actually at the start and the end of the day where the sunshine is just beautiful and you can take the most glorious pictures or at least I try to. Um, so I don't know whether it, we're at the start of the day or the end of the day, but it is a golden hour. Um, and, and there's a feeling of consumers feeling responsible in this, but knowing also that they will call increasingly on governments and businesses to do that. And when we get to the next stage of this, I'd love to talk about some of the ways in which we can actually empower consumers with these new tools, mm -hmm. um, because data localization is not you know, the, the obvious answer to the problem of everything else I've just talked about, but it's ending up being that because we're not moving fast enough mm -hmm. and perhaps thinking big picture enough. So I hope that's helpful as a... Thank you very much, Helena. I think we could speak uh, hours and hours yes. about what are the good things which uh, these technological developments are bringing and what are the bad things. I have heard so many optimistic visions and also apocalyptic pictures uh -huh. uh, where we are entering in a black box where the people appear. And, and I think that we, we should be smart on uh, 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 imposing uh, the, the proper rules on those who have this in hands. And this is about not only responsibility, but also legal liability. And at the same time, to insist on uh, achieving more transparency. Mm -hmm. And it will be more and more the question also for the artificial intelligence uh, world, where all those biases and all those negative factors could turn easily against the individual, individual people. Thank you very much. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a very interesting uh, set of answers from different perspectives. Now I have another question uh, for the audience. Looking ahead, governments are more likely to conflict than collaborate on data flows. Yes or no, or undecided. Please use the Slido app. And we could also have some normal conversation here. So I now have a chance for a question from the audience. Uh, if some, somebody wants to ask something, uh, our 
distinguished panelists, please use the opportunity now, now or never. There will no be any other chance. <laughs> please, here, madam. Thank you. Could you int introduce first yourself? Thank you. I'm Yuki Hasega uh, from Japanese newspaper Yomiuri Shimbun. I just wanted to ask, I mean, this is about collaboration, but there's always somebody of some party not really committing or participating. How, how, how do we deal with that? We have good intentions and people get together, governments get together, but there's always somebody else or some other entities outside. How, how, how can we collaborate on that? Maybe it's a question for... The minister? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we don't need mic. For the rule yeah. maker? <laughs> That's, uh, we see in many cases uh, like uh, climate change issues and uh, WTO issues as well. And uh, so far uh, on this DFT, FT, DFFT issues, uh, sorry, we don't have a, a clear answer. Uh, but uh, first, uh, Japan tried to coordinate with the U.S. and the EU, and uh, uh, we will. We want to be. We want to create the models uh, on the rules, and uh, I think after that, we will uh, invite uh, other people. That's the one stream, and uh, another stream is. Uh, uh, I think the, the uh, as I told you, um, platform will be necessary, and, and uh, where they are all the parties can participate. So oh, I think that in the link, link, linking these two streams will be the key. Uh, but uh, it is true, I think the, even so, or some countries or some members will drop, uh, will try to drop out of uh, this stream. You know, I think disagreement is what makes the world go around, unfortunately. I mean, mm -hmm. if we all agreed on everything, we might not even have Davos. But, um, the, you know, for, for example, uh, I happen to believe that data localization is very bad public policy. Right. Um, and uh, it, it, there's, it's a very false choice between thinking security and data localization should go hand in hand. They're, they're two very different things. Data should be secured wherever it is. Uh, data localization is, if anything, is actually less secure than not. Um, the reality is that there are countries that are adopting data localization. Mm -hmm. So for us as a global company, we have to adapt to that. And what does that mean? We have to build out data centers and security on the, the land of those, of those countries. To think that what we could build in data centers in a single country would ever be as good as a global network with four instances backed up around the world. We have almost a thousand people. Visa has 20,000 employees. We have almost a thousand people who work in cybersecurity, not part time. They come in every day and they work on cybersecurity. I can't, I can't afford to put that a uh, hundred people or a thousand people in every country where data lo localization takes place and I have to have data centers. So the, the simple fact of the matter is that our security in our global network is always going to be more robust than it is on a local level. We will do everything we can to make sure it, it is protected. But the reality is once you start fragmenting this data, which is one of the other things that data localization does, right. you open up more weak points or potential weaker points for, for data to be compromised. So it's, it's actually a very bad thing. The other thing it can do is reduces innovation, re reduces the ability to produce value because you just don't have, you know, data by itself is isolated. Data gets powerful when it, when it gets linked with other data, and it gets even more powerful when AI and machine language are applied to it. All those things are not bad things. They're, they're, they're more often than not very, very positive things. They're very, very good for consumers around the world. But you can't do those things if, if you choose to go down a world that's going to be very fragmented and isolated. I happen to take the other side of that argument, that we should have a very open world where the data flows with an incredible emphasis on the security of that, of that data. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Elena? 
something to add? Well, I, so I, I'm intrigued by the point about collaboration because it's something we see all the time. I mean, the, the fact that there are the sort of lack of mention of consumers in, in discussion and in statements from the G20 and others is, is something I think we can build on. I'd love to, to come to this point, though. Um, I, I think we're, we're probably in a moment where we're trying to find the, the solution to this sort of sense of how do we protect privacy but also reach to those innovative uh, points. The, the, the lack of consumer protection around the world is, is part of the issue. I think Vera brought it up very well. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the places we, we, I referred to Zimbabwe at the start here, it's taken 10 years for them to get a Consumer Protection Act. You know, if you look at the state of um, protection for consumers just on e-commerce, let alone getting into bigger picture points about data flows and AI and all of this, um, really there are very few countries and there are very few places where that's been put in place in a robust way. And what's fantastic is seeing some companies use that as the basis for the future and say, right, consumer protection, consumer rights, if you like, are the basic way in which we're going to say the world is going to turn. And let's take and innovate from there. And there are some really interesting pieces coming from that. I think the other part is it's so difficult to find where discrimination or, or problems are cropping up. And so that's the other piece of enforcement, which is always a fun topic to talk about. But it's um, if we were able, you know, the, the NCC, the Norwegian examples that we gave are 20 months after GDPR has been put in place. You know, data is being shared. Mm -hmm. So how do we get a cleverer, more agile, more powerful form of enforcement and protection uh, for consumers? Those are things that, that need to be in place as well. So how can we grow that to enable more trust in the, the, the potential for the future? I mean, m my take is we have to move past consumer protection to consumer control and consumer management. Awesome, yes. Uh, the re reality is that data privacy is kind of taking the negative side of it in my mind that it suggests that you know we're going to tie all this data up and nobody will ever get it well data can can open up all kinds of opportunities and values for 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 people and i'd like to get to the point where the consumer controls and manages their data. What does that mean? They know who has their data. They know why they're using it. They've given them permission to use it. They can go back and suspend the use of that. They can go back and ask to have that data deleted on a, on a permanent basis. And if they're too busy to do it, they could p p p define parameters around permissioning, and a third party can do that permissioning mm -hmm. For, th for them. So the consumer who isn't necessarily interested in doing this on a regularized basis mm -hmm. can, can mm -hmm. uh, go to a trusted third party to handle that, that permissioning for them. That's where I think we need to, to get to. And I'd like to see, you know, I think that's something from a public-private perspective, back to your question on collaboration, that we should be collaborating on is putting the consumer front and center in, in, in control of their, their data. Well, time will show that uh, it pays off, uh, that uh, the protection of private data is an uh, enabling factor for honest and fair trade. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than data dumping and uh, data localization and all the protectionist uh, arrangements. So I think that uh, it is uh, uh, for the states like Japan, the EU, also United States to, to gradually show that, uh, that uh, this is the, the right way to go. And Minister, how far can trade rules go in encouraging data policy interoperability between nations? Yeah, that's the Actually, very difficult question. I know. And uh, we have, uh, you know, trade rules like uh, EPS and WTO, you know, e-commerce uh, under, under negotiation. But, uh, uh, you know, each country is a difficult uh, issue. Uh, how to say it? Uh, the data process developing in each country. But, uh, you know, or the, de as, how to say that, developing uh, how the stage is different. And each country has uh, its own uh, situation or reason. So, uh, but uh, 
it's difficult. But uh, however, given the proposal uh, from a private sector, uh, that now OECD decided to figure out what kind of rules are needed or missing, mm -hmm. uh, having the WTO negotiation in my mind. Uh, so I have a high expectation this OECD project. I think the WEF uh, is now doing the same kind of a project. Uh, so with uh, active participants from not only the government but also or from the private sector, I hope that the forward-looking discussions uh, would facilitate uh, interoperability with uh, utilization of various guidelines and the standards in addition to WTO rules. Yeah. Mr. Kelly, I know you yeah. want to add some. Uh, may, may I just give you an answer, uh, a question and then you can, okay. you can, because I see you, you have a real need to uh, re re react on this. Uh, after Cambridge Analytica, uh, we heard from Mark Zuckerberg that he himself mm -hmm. will promote worldwide convergence of, of data protection rules. Again, it was a, a nice uh, music for my ears because we were just before introducing GDPR into life. So I could not imagine better marketing than this <laughs> declaration. How can the businesses which uh, operate worldwide uh, help not to let the fragmentation to, to last and to, to help the, the, the convergence of the rules? Well, I think it's being vocal and collaborative with uh, central banks and regulators around the world. And I think that's the way this has to go. I, I, you know, I was going to react to the trade deals. I, uh, trade deals take too long. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I actually think that free flow of data should be in every trade agreement. It's, there's a great uh, uh, example in the U.S. Uh, MCA deal, the, the trade deal between U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Uh, the minister mentioned the, the deal between the U.S. and Japan, the work that Australia, Singapore, and, J and Japan, Singapore, and Australia are leading in the WTO mm -hmm. is terrific as well. But if, if we try to get this done through trade deals, we'll, there will be too many WEFs that will pass by. Certainly I won't be here. Uh, so we'll solve it through that. So I think we have to try to solve it through uh, collaboration, across uh, regions and then across uh, across the world and we it's it requires us all to work together and and find the right the right balance here but there the, in my mind I maybe I'm a glass half full person but I think data can be really secured well I think people I think businesses can be made to be good stewards of that data and I think we can be get to a world where consumers can be in charge of their d data and feel good about sharing it in instances where they believe they're going to get value from it. Okay, thank you very much. There are some more questions ready in the audience, but I'm afraid we only have five minutes to, to finish. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Helena, don't you mind? Well, maybe if I, let's, yeah? let's go to questions. Okay. I'll be quick. I'm just concerned about uh, developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to talk about it because uh, it's very well to talk about consumers, you know, controlling, managing their own data. But the capacity and ability of people from developing countries to do this is very limited. And also the benefits, you know, data is gold. Someone has called it the new gold. Who will benefit? People from developing countries will have their data flowing, which is good. I'm for it. The issue is how will they get the benefits of some of this data? And how will they also control and protect it when they don't have the means and the governments don't have the capacity? And regulation is weak. Thank you. And the second question, the gentleman behind you, and that's it. I have to be brutal. Uh, John Sippen of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. We do a lot of work on cyber security. Uh, security, Internet of Things, a global Internet. All three of those things are at risk uh, given the types of decisions that m may now be taken on 5G. Uh, the companies that are trying to work on 5G, Huawei, Qualcomm, uh, Nokia, Ericsson, have filed a huge amount of patents. Almost none of those patents are security patents. Uh, 
And of course, if people take very different routes to 5G, then there is that risk of a splinter net, mm -hmm. there is a risk of uh, security being uh, lost. And to the former minister's question about the developing world, uh, she was too polite to say it, but of course the digital Silk Road that China is promoting does create an opportunity for China to become a data superpower, grabbing that heterogeneous data that it doesn't have access to from the homogeneous data that it has amongst its own 1.4 million population. And I'm not certain that the people on the digital Digital Silk Road in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa have been in a position to impose security conditions mm. on the promoters of the Digital Silk Road. So those would be my two points. I would be delighted by the answer from the panel. Questions? And if I can pick to... back my time, because yes. I think uh, the former minister's comment was exactly. Yes. This is why I brought up Zimbabwe at the very start. So it's an interesting one because if you're dealing with this question on a, on a hundred in a hundred countries, um, one you've got should we be part of those conversations at the WTO? Um, and the answer is, well, we need cons the consumer voice to be everywhere. I think the uh, second part of the answer is consumer protection must be uh, developed and supported to be developed everywhere where it is not currently present. That's part, that has to be part of the answer. Um, the interesting piece is that regardless of where the sort of consumer advocacy voices are in this discussion, um, the, the piece about data localization seems to be a sort of, it's, it's not quite the right response. We know it's not the, respo the right response for the end of the story. Um, but how do we protect small and medium-sized enterprise? How do we support consumer choice? How do we, you know, how do we think about this? Um, it has to be done perhaps at speed, but also with thought, with the right level of inclusion and with the right level of thought about what we're doing because privacy is a human right at the end of the day and it can't be included in a trade discussion in a way that just removes any of that piece. So I know I'm answering a fraction of that entire piece, but it's, uh, yeah, thank you. May I ask you to conclude why you see the situation in one year time? You all, all, all three ministers. How, how, I'm uh, I'm how we, we shall progress, hopefully I'm in a good direction. And, and I'm sympathetic to the fact that different countries are in different st stages, but I come back to where I started, which is I think global interoperable open networks are going to continue to power the, the world. They're going to shrink the world. They're going to allow developing countries to be able to lift themselves up by, shr by shrinking the world. And uh, I think that data is, whether it's the gold or the fuel, it's an, a, a very important element of this. That said, it must be secured. That's like that's the starting point. It, it has to be secured. Everybody who uses has to be held to a very high standard of stewardship, and the consumer needs to be in charge. I, I think we can get to that that world. Mm -hmm. Okay, Minister. Okay. Um, first, I think the, the negotiations on the electric commerce uh, at the WTO uh, is uh, necessary to be concluded mm -hmm. uh, in the near future. And that will sh should include the three principles uh, I, I you know, introduced, the uh, free flow and uh, the no requirement of uh, uh, localization and the no requirement of uh, uh, you know, debt, a source code and uh, uh, algorithm uh, you know, open requirement. And, uh, and then I think I need a, a platform like this. You know, people can uh, discuss this issue and uh, need, to, need to collect the, all the best practices and the harmonization uh, will be necessary. So I think the WF, WEF's leadership will be the key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Helena, last word? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think you have we minus, will still be... Uh, I don't know how much. <laughs> I, I'm going to be... Um, I think we'll still be in that uh, slightly creepy, you know, are consumers actually entering the market because they're worried about this? But perhaps two great things could happen. If we could have a statement about consumers in these global agreements that being, are being made that could act as an anchor for us to talk about some of these issues in a, in a constructive way. And then the 
second piece would be, can we find some really meaningful innovation examples mm -hmm. where you can see how this can work and can we sort of address uh, some of the sustainable consumption of, uh, issues that we have through the conversations that we're having and demonstrate that, you know, whether it's in Indonesia or in, you know, Zimbabwe or, you know, let's take hold of that and use it for, for meaningful purpose. Those would be two things I would love to see in, in a year's time. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> awesome. And I thank you for okay, thank you very much. your very valuable uh, comments and, and contributions. I think it shows that the data flows cannot go without trust mm -hmm. and without responsibility and without connecting powers. Uh, not only for, for our world where we have the standards, but also uh, pushing the rest of the world where we would really wish the citizens to be better protected, not only as consumers, but also as, as citizens. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy Davos. Thank you.